She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signals in my mind Forget to operate Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and welcome back to Coffee and Crime Time. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for joining me still. Every time I post a video, even though the world has literally turned upside down, I'm so glad that you're here. And I have a case today that's very close to my heart and has been very much on my mind the last couple of weeks. I've been following it. I was hoping I wouldn't have to make a video about it. I was hoping it would resolve itself, but it hasn't. So I really want to raise awareness for it now. I really want to get eyes on this. I really want to get you guys in on the discussion. Before we get started though, I'd like to have a word from our sponsor. Our sponsor for today is Bright Sellers. Bright Sellers is a monthly wine subscription service that uses a seven question quiz to match you with wines based on your tastes, what you like and what you want. The quiz is based on an algorithm that basically analyzes your taste profile so that you're going to get wines you're guaranteed to enjoy. It's also going to introduce you to wines that you've never tried before. And if you like wine the way that I do, I was brought up on wine. My dad's Italian, my whole family's Italian. He's owned restaurants since I can remember, since I could walk. So I've always been around that wine culture, tasting the wine, trying to get the flavor profiles, matching it to the correct food. But so often I am a creature of habits. So when I find myself going to the liquor store, I just always buy what I know I like because I'm afraid to take that chance. But this is my second bright sellers box they sent six bottles one month and another six this month and I have not come across a wine from them that I didn't enjoy I loved every single one from the last month so not only are they personalizing wines based on what you want giving you the opportunity to try new wines that they're sure you'll like based on your taste but they're delivering it to your front door and that's really handy in a time like this when almost everything is closed, especially here in New York, there's nothing really open besides what's deemed essential. And even if the liquor stores were open, I don't think I would wanna go out shopping around other people. So having a box of six bottles of wine delivered to my front door was amazing. The last month I got my Bright Seller shipment, my husband Adam and I just opened a new bottle once every three or four days and tried it together and talked about how we liked it, why we liked it, it. And the cool thing is the wines come with these cards that tell you everything you need to know about them. And I love these cards because they look so cool. They're like, they're like trading cards. They're like Pokemon cards and you can store them and keep them so that you know if you liked the wine, what you thought about it. And then when you rate your wines before your next box comes, you'll be able to say if you liked it or not. And then they'll, they'll kind of revise that, uh, that test or that quiz and that taste profile. So the wines just come in a big box like this. Now I have to admit, I already did drink one of these bottles, um, during a live a couple of days ago. I loved it. It was so good. I had the Mojave rain. So good, it's a cab. Next, I want to try uh, this super genre because it looks so cool to me and it's also a cab. I like cabs, see I'm still sticking in my, my habits. <laughs> but these cards will tell you everything you need to know about your new wine, um, how much alcohol is in it, what temperature you should serve it at, what food you should serve it with, the taste profiles. The super genre cab that I wanna try next, it shows you everything, all the taste profiles that are in there, plum, cherry, black currant, chocolate. It tells you you should pair it with a roasted mushroom bruschetta and a hearty beef stew for a cold weather night. Oh my god. Yes to all of that. But this is a really great service and especially if you're like me, you're introverted, you really don't like going out, you really don't like going shopping and especially like me if you are currently stuck in quarantine right now, it's such a great service to have. And Bright Sellers is offering you 50% off of your first six bottle box if you go in the description box and click the link. It's really easy, it's really fun. If you're interested, click that link, take the seven question quiz and see what comes to your door. Thank you so much to Bright Sellers for sponsoring this video. Thank you guys for listening to the sponsor. As you know, sponsors are a part of what keeps this channel afloat and allows me to keep bringing you content. Holly Ellsworth Clark, please remember this name. More importantly, remember the girl who the name belongs to because she's been missing now since January 11th. 
A quick disclaimer before we move on. I, as much as the next person, love a good mystery. Some of us live for it. But as I tell you the facts of this case, please remember, this is new. It's a new case, essentially, just uh, happening since January, and it's ongoing. And this is a girl who has a life and a family, a family who are still desperately trying to find her. So please keep in mind, if your comments aren't kind, if they're not productive, just don't make them because the family of Holly Clark needs support and understanding and importantly, hope right now. And I know that you guys in this community are the best people to give them that. I certainly want you to tell me what you think, how you feel. I want you to speculate, you know, if you want, but just keep in mind that this is a girl who's missing. It's a very new case, it's still ongoing. Her family's looking for her and searching for her at this exact moment. And our goal here is to raise awareness for her case so that hopefully she can be spotted. It's not to be insulting, it's not to uh, make suggestions that may paint her in a bad light. Just keep that in mind. I know I really don't have to remind you guys, you're for the most part, um, the people on this channel, 99% of you are completely kind, completely sweet, and are here for the right reasons. So it's just for that 1% that feels this is appropriate sometimes to talk badly about victims of uh, these cases. So let's talk about who Holly is. From what I can see, she's one of the coolest girls in the world. One of these girls that every other girl or woman wants to be or be friends with. She could have been a friend to me. She could have been, you know, my little sister. I understand this girl and, you know, what she was doing and what she wanted to do in her life because she had big dreams. She's pretty, smart, talented, edgy, kind, and completely unique. Holly is 27 years old. She's been described as being 6'1 and 200 pounds with brown eyes, brown hair with red highlights cut into distinctive short bangs, and an athletic build. She was originally from the Calgary area in Canada where she studied political science at the University of Calgary. While she was there, she won three gold medals and one silver medal competing on the school's wrestling team. A little bit before she graduated, her father Dave taught her some chords on the guitar and she never put her guitar down after that. Her love of music motivated her to join some bands and perform at open mic nights, eventually becoming an integral part of her town's music scene. Now, after graduating from college, Holly moved to Toronto with a fellow bandmate and a boyfriend she'd been dating for a little over a year. Now, it seems like while they were there, the band broke up, and so did Holly and her boyfriend. At this point, she moved from Toronto to Hamilton, Ontario, which also has a flourishing music scene. And she arrived there in October of 2019, and it looks like at first she was with another band. But that band didn't work out, or they broke up as well, and she decided to uh, stay in Hamilton and just pursue a solo music career. In Hamilton, she lived with roommates, other musicians, in a house that included a recording studio. She began checking out the music scene in Hamilton, going to open mic nights, playing shows. I don't know if you like me, so I'm hot So Holly was new to Hamilton when she went missing, and I was lucky enough to be able to speak with her friend Al McPherson, a woman that's really heading up search efforts for Holly, and she was so helpful, such a sweet, sweet woman, so really just intent on finding out what happened to Holly. Everybody needs a friend like Al. Now, according to Alan Hamilton, Holly hadn't made a ton of friends yet, so she had her friends at home and her family at home in Calgary, but she basically worked from home, so she didn't have an office that she would go to every day and coworkers that she would see every day, and then at night she'd perform or rehearse. 
but there's no reports of anyone that was in Holly's life, whether it be in Hamilton or back home in Calgary, who said Holly was acting strangely in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. However, in the days before her disappearance, there were some odd events that stood out to the people in Holly's life. On Wednesday, January 8th, Holly was gone all night, and on the morning of Thursday, January 9th, her roommates reported that instead of arriving home and using the front door as would be customary, Holly broke in through the window of her room. According to them, she claimed she'd been running through the woods all night away from two men. Now, unbeknownst to her, the roommates did call the police because they were concerned about Holly's mental state, and it appears the police did come and speak to Holly, but they decided she seemed fine and left. That same day, Holly called her mother, but her mother wasn't able to answer the phone, so Holly left a voicemail. In this voicemail, she's clearly distraught, upset, um, sad even, and she begs her parents to get her a plane to get home. I'm going to play that voicemail for you now. I would really, really, really like a plane to get out of Hamilton to Calgary, please, and I would like to come home and visit you in Dave. I'm missing you so much. And I love you so much. So that's that's all I want in the world is to see you in this day. Because I love you both so, 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 so much. So, um, uh, if you could please, um, uh, if you could please help me out with a, a plane ticket, that would be... That would be really, really greatly appreciated. Okay, I love you. I love you and I look forward to hearing from you. Now, Holly's parents did not hear this voicemail until after she went missing, but her father, Dave, was able to talk to her the next day, Friday, January 10th, and according to him, she seemed completely terrified. He claims she told him that she'd been running away from two men and she was afraid for her life. Now, he asked her, um, you know, do you want me to get a plane ticket for you or do you want me to fly to Hamilton and get you myself? And she told him that she'd really prefer for him to come and get her. He said, quote, we didn't know what to do. It sounded preposterous. I said I was coming to get her, and the next day she disappeared. On January 11th, Holly left her house around 4.18 p.m. It was a very cold and windy day in Hamilton, and it was pouring outside, but Holly left not dressed for the weather. She was wearing a black shirt, black pants, and black ankle boots. She also left her money, her debit cards, credit cards, belongings, and cell phone at her house. So this 27-year-old girl encountering the things that she claimed she'd encountered in the past few days, telling more than one person she was afraid and running for her life away from two men, she leaves the house during a torrential downpour, not dressed for the weather, and forgetting either accidentally or purposely her cell phone, money, and personal items. Now, this was the last time Holly was physically seen in person by someone. According to her roommates, she seemed a bit distressed, uh, but otherwise, you know, healthy and normal. Luckily, Holly was caught on some surveillance cameras, so the police and her family were able to see what her movements were in the time after she left her house. According to Holly's friend Al, they have seven different clips of Holly on surveillance, which shows the route she took, but the story that the footage tells doesn't really make sense. It was initially reported from stills of Holly when she left her house that she was carrying a book bag or a knapsack of some kind, but that wasn't true. She didn't have anything with her. However, when she shows up on camera 14 minutes after she leaves her home, she's seen wearing a black garbage bag over her torso, like over her shirt. A few minutes later, she's seen on surveillance again. She's still wearing the garbage bag over her shirt, but this time she also has a garbage bag that she's carrying that appears to be about halfway full. A few minutes later, when she pops up on surveillance again, that garbage bag that she was carrying is gone, and the last time she's seen on camera is 4.55, 37 minutes after she left her house. But where did she go? What was in the garbage bag she was carrying? Where'd she get the garbage bag she was wearing and the one she was carrying? And where did the one she was carrying go when we saw her last? Why was she wearing a garbage bag over her shirt and her clothes? Now the last question I think I can answer, Holly was a very active, outdoorsy kind of girl. She loved running and hiking. She also had no problem being outside at night or in the elements, snow, sun, or rain. In fact, I saw it reported that Holly actually would choose to go running in the rain if she was bothered by something or had something on her mind, which is really relatable to me because I would do the same thing in college. Whenever I saw it was about to rain, 
I'd grab my, my running shoes because college was stressful, all these new people around, I'm not really close to anybody. And it was just a nice escape to be out with the cold rain hitting my face. It gave me time to think. Now, wearing the garbage bag, Holly's family claims this is something that, you know, she was taught to do, something that they did. They'd go camping or on kayaking trips or to outdoor events, and if it rained, they would just use garbage bags as, like, makeshift raincoats to keep them dry. Seeing her on surveillance with the garbage bag on, it actually encouraged her parents because they knew that she was at least, you know, somewhat uh, lucid, that she was utilizing the skills she'd learned in order to protect herself. So she was there mentally enough to make that decision to know she needed to put something on so she wouldn't get soaking wet. Holly also had some survival skills from her time spent camping with her family, and it was reported that she knew how to build debris huts. Now, I had, I had to look this up because Here's where Holly and I differ. I'm not a big fan of camping, but apparently a debris hut is a versatile survival shelter that can be built in almost any habitat and doesn't require any tools or special equipment to build it. It looks like you basically just have to take what you have, like leaves and branches and mud, and, and you create a shelter from, you know, what you have at your disposal. So she did have some experience taking care of herself in the elements outdoors. Um, she was strong, you know, basically a professional college-level athlete. I also got the impression from what I was reading and talking with Elle that Holly and her family were incredibly close. If you scroll through her Facebook, you see a lot of um, positive talk about her siblings. She has a brother and a sister. And of course, I'm sure they have the ability to drive each other crazy like most siblings do, but you can also tell that they're fiercely loyal to each other. They have a very tight bond. Let's quickly talk about the route Holly took after she left her house and was caught seven times on surveillance. It seems that she just kind of circled around the neighborhood within a mile of her home, and that's the confusing part. So her house was located on the corner of Sanford and Bristol. It looks like she crossed Barton, she cuts through Woodland Park, and then she pops out on Wentworth Street. She goes up Wentworth Street and she's picked up on surveillance on Wentworth and Shaw. That's when she's seen wearing the garbage bag. Six minutes later, the surveillance camera outside of Wentworth Metal Recycling picks her up again, and this is when you can see the garbage bag over her shoulder. She's seen crossing the railroad tracks on Wentworth, no longer with the garbage bag that she was carrying, and then she vanishes. The businesses further up the road don't catch her walking by. In that small blind spot that no surveillance camera could see, something happened. She went somewhere, but we don't know where. Maybe she was picked up by someone that was driving in a car. That's the only way I can see her not being caught on camera further up Wentworth or anywhere else either. Now the search for Holly was pretty extensive with everyone in Hamilton pitching in to lend a hand and find her. Her parents arrived in Hamilton on January 12th. They put up posters with her face and information everywhere. They searched the areas she was last seen. They searched her favorite trails and routes. She liked to run and hike, but there was no sign of her. Now according to Al, Holly only had $45 in cash on her when she left the house and her bank accounts and social media have shown no activity since she left. I brought up the possibility to Elle that the garbage bag was previously left there by Holly herself, maybe with some fresh clothes and money, a go bag of sorts. Maybe she was afraid for her life and knew she'd have to run or get out of there quickly, so she stashed it someplace in a garbage bag so that it would be safe from the rain and the elements. And Al said that they have considered that possibility, but the only problem is they checked Holly's bank accounts in the time before she disappeared, and they checked for like cash withdrawals, you know, because if somebody was planning on leaving, they'd need money. And if they're gonna leave their credit cards and everything at home, they'd need cash. So they're looking for withdrawals of cash, several of them or large amounts, but there wasn't any withdrawals of cash. Well, there was one, but it was for $100, and Elle thinks that's where the $45 came from, that was the remainder of whatever she pulled out from the 100. But in general, it's not as if she'd been going the last couple of months every week pulling out money and stowing it away. If you're planning on disappearing, you're gonna need a hell of a lot more money than $45 to make it. Now, there was another alleged sighting of Holly, which happened on February 3rd. The police and the family have decided not to release this footage because the face of the person in it is blurry, and they can't confirm 100% that it's Holly, but her friends and her family believe it is. 
The woman on this footage walks by a pole with a missing person's poster on it showing Holly's face. She's walking pretty quickly. She's been described as walking as if she's on a mission, and she does appear to have a garbage bag over her shoulder. She is again walking near Wentworth and Shaw, but she's seen wearing different clothes than Holly was last seen in. This woman's wearing jeans, a shirt, and a coat that Holly's family don't recognize as her clothes, but they say her mannerisms, the way she walks, her physical appearance, including her height, make them 95% sure that it is her. Now this obviously would give the family hope that Holly was okay, hadn't been taken, hadn't been hurt, but now it's over a month later and there's still no sign of her. She hasn't popped back up anywhere. So what are the theories? What happened to Holly Clark? Where is she? Was she in danger? Now it's worth noting the police claim they don't believe there was any foul play involved here. But I feel personally for them to believe this, they'd have to know something that we don't and that maybe even the family doesn't because the family doesn't seem to believe that um, it's 100% sure nothing happened to her. There's also been questions raised about Holly's mental health status as well or whether she was doing any drugs. Holly has no history of using drugs, um, she's not even a big drinker, and she also has no history of mental health issues. Now her behavior on that voicemail has caused some to say that it sounds like she was under the influence of something, but I really, I disagree. She's clearly distraught in this call, but you can hear parts of the call where she makes an effort to calm herself and speak normally. So if you were hopped up on, on some drugs that's making you act a little uh, crazy or a little erratic, you're not gonna have that presence of mind in the same phone call to be like, okay, I need to calm down. I don't wanna scare my parents. Let me just um, you know, even out my voice a little bit here. You're really not gonna have that, that presence of mind because you're not completely in charge. Others have suggested that she may be experiencing symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia, seeing things that aren't there, such as two men chasing her. Now, it's also worth noting that Holly has no family history of mental illness. Um, she does sometimes suffer from anxiety, but who doesn't, right? Who doesn't? A schizophrenia occurs in about 1.1% of the population, so it's not extremely common. And age of onset for it is late adolescence to early adulthood, somewhere between 17 and 30, so the age fits if she was going to start experiencing symptoms of schizophrenia, but there's no signs of anything like that before she went missing. And I have to think someone would have noticed. She talked to her friends and her family back home almost daily on the phone. She was working from home in a job that entailed her to be on the phone with people. No one reported bizarre behavior or her saying anything out of the ordinary. Her roommates who lived with her didn't report anything strange about her behavior in the weeks leading up to her disappearance, besides that one day when she broke into her own room. And she was continuing to write music, go to work, you know, do her job, and perform. In my opinion, I think the phone call wanting to come home was either as a result of her feeling unsafe for some reason, or because she was just lonely. She'd moved quite a bit in the past two years. She'd broken up with a boy, been in two bands that didn't work out. She didn't really have any close friends in Hamilton yet since she was fairly new to the area. She most likely felt pretty isolated and missed her friends and family back home. The fact that she told both her roommates and her parents that two men were chasing her does concern me. The fact that there's been no sign of her does concern me. Now, some people do believe that she left on her own, that she's in some sort of hiding that she doesn't want to be found. According to Elle, as they've been out searching for her still, people will sometimes tell them, hey, stop looking, you know? She's been seen, um, she doesn't want to be found, leave her alone. And there have been roughly seven to eight sightings of Holly, so apparently people believe she's just safe and hiding out. And Elle told me, yeah, that, that's true, there have been many sightings of Holly, but each and every one has been looked into, checked out, and ruled out. The girl's always discovered to be not Holly Clark. So is it possible she was taken for the purposes of human trafficking? Holly's father, Dave, allegedly received a tip that she had been taken and was being held against her will at a budget inn, but both the family and the police staked out this motel, and eventually the police did go in and knock on every door to see if she was in there, and she wasn't. It seems to be a case of mistaken identity again. Now, according to what I read on the website, the Hamilton area does seem to have a little bit of a problem with women being taken in traffic. On March 2nd of this year, two brothers from Quebec were arrested when Hamilton police received information from the Canadian Human Trafficking Hotline that there were two women in distress at a local Airbnb. These women had contacted the 
hotline and said that they were being held against their will and being forced to work in the sex industry. Now I did send this article to Elle and I was like, hey, did you guys look into this? Is there a connection with these two guys? And Elle told me that they did look into it, but there appears to be no connection. However, I think it does show you that these kinds of people don't operate, you know, just in big cities or in affiliation with larger organizations. Sometimes it's just a small group of people a family business, people who are operating on their own without a huge network out there to support them. However, I do find it hard to believe that these kinds of predators would target a girl who physically looks as tall and strong as Holly. The common denominator of trafficking victims is they're vulnerable in some way, whether emotionally or physically. They have some sort of vulnerability for these people to prey on and use to their advantage. Now, it's possible that these guys could have seen her perform one night, become interested in her. They could have followed her to see where she worked, where she went, where she lived. They could have figured out that she'd often run or hike outside by herself and followed her one day, chasing her through the woods, but she escaped because she's very athletic. They may not have been expecting that. She could have been afraid that they were still looking for her, still following her. Maybe she figured out that they knew where she lived and that's why she went in through the window instead of the front door so they wouldn't see her coming home. What I do believe though is that Holly genuinely believed she was being pursued. Whether it's the truth or not, I believe that she genuinely believed it herself. But if she felt like she was in danger, why didn't she go to the police? Why didn't she just go home immediately to Calgary or wait for her dad and her mom to get there so that she could be safe? Did these people that were chasing her threaten her family? Or did they tell her that, you know, if she said anything or went to get help, they would hurt someone that she loved or was close to? This case reminds me so much of the Eliza Lamb case, specifically because of the eeriness of the videos that these two women were last seen in. Uh, Eliza Lamb has her elevator video that has seriously stumped everybody. And now we have this video of Holly, the video that was caught on the day she left, and her movements and where she's seen and how she just kind of vanishes, it doesn't make sense. Why did she take that route? Why did she not have a garbage bag that was full of something and then suddenly pop up with a garbage bag that had something in it and then the next time she's seen on camera, the garbage bag's gone? Did she put the garbage bag there? Did she just grab a garbage bag and put some things she found in it? But it seemed as if she knew where she was going, right? Because from the time she left her house to the time that she's last seen without the garbage bag and she disappears, it wasn't even an hour. So. That's not a lot of time. And where did the bag go? Where did she put it? Was she seen on February 3rd in that surveillance video that can't be confirmed that it's her, but her parents and her family believe it is? Was she coming back for the bag? And that's why you see her on video with the bag again. This case, the way it played out, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up at all. Very similar to the Eliza Lamb video. And there's so many more questions than answers. So this leaves us with really very few theories. I mean, they're all pretty simple. She either left on her own, but if she left on her own, why would she have called her parents just the day before begging to come home and saying she missed them and she loved them and she wanted to be with them and that's all she wanted? Why would she leave? Or there's foul play here and somebody was pursuing her, somebody was watching her and somebody was trying to get her that she was running away from. Or there's been some sort of mental break here where she doesn't have um, a really good grasp on reality and she's seeing things and imagining things and becoming paranoid as a result. Additionally, in that February 3rd video, she's wearing different clothes than she was seen in initially. So remember when she disappeared, she was wearing black pants, a black shirt, and black ankle boots. But in this video, the person who is, you know, thought to be Holly is wearing jeans and a sweater and a coat. And these these uh, items aren't recognized by her family. Like they don't believe those are her items. And she left everything behind at home. All her belongings, her clothes, her money, her phone. Now the phone being left behind really makes me think that she didn't want to be found. But whether it was that she didn't want to be found by the people who knew her or she didn't want to be found by the people who were pursuing her because you you know you can track someone using their cell phone. So she seems to be taking a lot of precautions when she leaves to not be found or followed. Now I also asked Elle, you know, because I'm trying to um, take a take a walk in Holly's shoes. Like if I thought somebody 
was pursuing me, what would I do? I would try to not be seen. So is it possible that she could be kind of hanging out in the areas where homeless people live? That way she can just blend in. And Elle said that they, they have talked to the homeless population in Hamilton, that they've been really helpful and really open and they're keeping a lookout for Holly, but they haven't seen her. And this is a girl who's very tall, you know, six foot, six foot one, she's going to be easily seen and easily spotted. She's a really, really pretty girl with distinctive features and she's tall. So it's not gonna be one of those situations or cases where, you know, she's of average height, she looks average, there's nothing about her that kind of stands out in a crowd. Holly would stand out in a crowd, so why has nobody seen her? And I also asked Elle, you know, was Holly the kind of person who might just leave her phone at home? Because some people do that. It's not me, but some people do. They leave their phones at home when they go hiking or running because they don't want to be distracted and they kind of just want to separate from reality and be alone. But Elle said, no, that, that wasn't Holly at all. Holly always had her phone on her for a couple reasons. First of all, when she was running or hiking, she liked to listen to music and you could often see her singing to herself while she was running or walking because she was always listening to music. And additionally, she really liked taking pictures of cool things she saw while she was out and about with her phone. Holly loved train tracks and you can see on her social media, Instagram, that she's got pictures of train tracks and other cool things that she encounters while she's going about her day. So she definitely wouldn't have left her phone home if she was just going out for a regular walk or run. I was also wondering if maybe Holly would go out somewhere, like in the wilderness, deep in the woods, and make one of those debris shelters and just hide out there until whatever she was afraid of was gone or not a threat anymore. I'm not sure how long she'd, she'd be there or how long she'd expect she'd have to be there, but she would be capable of surviving out in the wilderness if she had to. Or maybe she broke into some abandoned building to hide out in there, but once again, these areas are being searched everybody's looking for her and there's been no sign of her. It seems like she just disappeared. She vanished into thin air. I was wondering maybe did the breakup with her boyfriend upset her? It seemed like they were together for, you know, quite a while, a longish term relationship. They left Calgary together to move to Toronto to try to, you know, make it in the music industry and then they broke up. Was that still weighing on her? Was it still bothering her? Was she heartbroken from it? But it had been several months since that happened. And as far as I can tell, uh, this boyfriend is helping to look for her and is just as worried as everybody else. And it seems like they still had some kind of relationship. Like it wasn't a, a hostile relationship. So, I mean, I really just can't figure out what, what could have happened. The only thing I can think of is that she did have some sort of mental... Um, break or some break with reality. So I really, really, really want this case solved. I want Holly found. It's been bothering me, especially with everything that's going on now. I just imagine the world absolutely in shambles like this and Holly is out there on her own. And does she know what's happening? Is she still alive? I have to believe that she is still alive. But at this point for the police to keep saying they don't believe there's any foul play or any criminality involved, that bothers me because there's been no sign of her. If nothing had happened to her, if nobody had taken her, she would have popped up and been seen by someone at this point. But her family and her friends are still looking for her. They're not going to stop until they find her and they know what happened. They're incredibly worried. There's a GoFundMe. I donated to it and I will put it in the description box. I know times are hard right now and everybody's kind of um, worried about where their next paycheck's gonna come from or you know if they're still gonna have a job at the end of this quarantine thing. But if you have a couple extra bucks, I will put the link in the description box and you can check it out and see if it's something you'd like to donate. And essentially what it is is to just keep the search going because Holly's parents will have to travel back and forth and they're not going to be able to work and you know it's just a bad situation and they don't want to stop looking they don't want to go home and just say well you know if she comes back she comes back they want to be there where she disappeared so that they can hopefully find her you know this girl has a lot going for her um incredibly talented musician a great singer a great songwriter she has a lot of potential she's artistic and she's um sensitive and kind and caring and i really really want a happy ending for this 2020 has been rough we haven't had um I, I could say we haven't had many happy endings but really we haven't had any happy endings in 2020 for these cases that we cover 
I really want to see a happy ending for Holly Clark and her family and her friends. This article from CBC News was published at the end of February, and it basically says that um, there was six weeks of intense searching for Holly Ellsworth Clark with no new clues, and the family of the missing 27-year-old is preparing to return home to Calgary. Dave Clark told CBC News that the family is spending the week and the next spreading awareness in Toronto. If nothing new surfaces, they'll pack Holly's possessions, which are still in her room, and fly out of Hamilton. And they have done that. They had to pack up all her things um, because, you know, her lease was up and there was no point in, in keeping it renewed. Dave Clark said it was heartbreaking to take the cards and pictures off her fridge. Holly's apartment, Dave says, is full of plants waiting to be watered, seeds waiting to be planted, handmade lyric books, and groceries she bought for an event on January 11th, the night she disappeared. So that's interesting and something that I haven't seen yet. So she had an event on January 11th, it looks like, or some sort of planned thing that she purchased food for. That, to me, makes it less likely that she just took off by herself, planning to not come back. This article says, while Dave loses sleep thinking of every possibility imaginable, he's trying to remain positive, even if the best case scenario is looking for someone who might not want to be found, even by her family. He said, quote, I hope she's hiding from us, from someone. That would be an optimistic outcome. But Dave knows they can't continue searching with this level of intensity, and with more than $20,000 spent, no new leads, and few details on why Holly vanished to begin with, he has no reason to stay in Hamilton. We've always been expecting to find her next week. Nobody wants to find their child dead, but the longer something goes on, the more statistically likely that is. We don't want to waste people's money in a fruitless search. Holly's brother and sister, Kate and Caleb, are spreading awareness in Toronto. Now you've seen Holly's poster, you know her story, you know the circumstances, you know what she looks like. If you see her or anybody that you think even looks like her, there are ways to get a hold of the family and the police to phone this tip in. And honestly, at this point, no tip is too small. You shouldn't feel embarrassed or be like, oh, I'm not quite sure. Any tip will help because they can be checked into. So you can email Bring Holly Home 2020 at gmail.com and I'll put all this information in the description box. There's also a Facebook page that you can go to and check out to see if there's any new information. I'm gonna put some articles written by CBC News um, in Hamilton because they did a really good job. Uh, I think it was Bobby Rostova seems to be the guy who has been keeping up with this really. Every new update that comes out, he's on top of it, so that's good. But at this point, the trail has truly gone cold. And what I just can't get over is why she would leave the day after begging her parents to come home. I don't think she left or stayed gone of her own free will. I definitely think that something happened. I definitely think that at least she believes she was being pursued. I definitely think she believes somebody was after her or she wouldn't be doing this to her family. And I just hope that somebody wasn't really after her. I hope she's just hiding and she's found because if somebody was after her and at this point she hasn't been seen in over a month, assuming that that you know, sighting on February 3rd was her. It's been over a month. If that sighting wasn't her, it's been longer. That would lead me to believe that whoever was chasing her got to her. And that is the last thing that I would want. I want this woman found, guys. I really need something good to happen in the world. And having Holly back home with her family, even if she did experience some kind of mental break, they can get her the help that she needs, allow her to continue on with her life, allow her to continue pursuing her dream of you know, being a singer and a songwriter, allow her to keep doing what she loved, which was being on stage and singing for people and creating music and sharing her love and her passion for music with everybody who was listening. That's what she loved. That's where she felt at home. And I want to get her back there. I am so worried about this girl. I'm so worried that if she is alive and hiding, she's scared and confused. And hopefully that best case scenario, which is she's hiding from someone, is what's happening here and she's found soon or or resurfaces soon. Okay, that's going to be it for now. I'm going to keep my eyes on this. I'm going to be in contact with Elle, so if something pops up, I will update you. I'm going to start posting updates and sharing things on Twitter, so if you guys aren't following me on Twitter, go ahead and follow me. It's in the description box. And go in the description box if you want to check out uh, certain links and read more into this. If you want to go to the Facebook page or if you want to donate to the GoFundMe to help Holly's parents continue looking for her and flying back and forth from Calgary to Hamilton. Let me know what you guys think about this. Let me know what your theories are. Let me know which of these theories seems to be the most likely, but 
at the end of the day, I just, I want her to, to get back home. I want her to be safe and I want her to get back home. It's cases like this where a person being missing is, is almost worse than knowing they're gone because you don't know what's happening. You don't know how they're feeling. You don't know if they're safe. You don't know if they're upset. You don't know if they're being hurt. And it, it can be incredibly draining and traumatizing for the people that are left behind wondering what happened. And hopefully there were not two men chasing her and trying to get her because that is incredibly worrisome to me. And it's worrisome to me that the police seem to think there's no criminality involved when she told two different people that, that she was running away from two men in the woods. That bothers me. And that there wasn't maybe more done to check up on her after hearing that story and knowing that she had this odd behavior of breaking into her room that night. The police, I really feel, should have done more. Maybe, um, I don't know, asked more questions or did more to help her before she went missing. But that's just my opinion. Let me know what you guys think. Remember to check the links in the description box for Bright Sellers if you're interested in checking it out for all of the uh, materials related to this case. Also follow me on Instagram and Twitter. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and subscribe, share this video, get the word about Holly out there. I really want her face everywhere because who knows where she could be at this point and hopefully somebody would see her. Thank you so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and stay home and I'll see you next time. Bye. Water level don't break now. And the bottle's going straight down.